This is going to be Genesis chapter 28, and I want to talk about the subject of thinking about God. How often do you think about God? You need to be thinking about God before every decision you make, before everything you do. So let's go through this chapter with that topic in mind in Genesis 28.1. It says, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. So the first thing is, you need to think about God when choosing a mate. When you're choosing a husband or a wife, even girlfriend or boyfriend. I mean, you don't want to choose a girlfriend or boyfriend that you don't see as someone that you would potentially marry one day. That wouldn't be a good idea. But here in verse 1, Isaac is blessing Jacob. It says, and he blessed him and charged him. So this should erase any doubts in Jacob's mind about possibly getting the blessing taken away as a punishment for the deception that he just did back in chapter 27. Isaac doesn't want Jacob to marry a daughter of the Canaanites. Not because of a different race, but because he would be marrying into idol worship. Just like today, we shouldn't marry someone who's not saved. And when Paul gives instructions on marriage in 1 Corinthians 7.39, he says, uh, you can marry whom you will, but only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. So what does that mean? Think about the Lord when choosing a mate. And he says in verse 2, Arise, go to Padanaram, Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So Laban, that's Rebekah's brother. Uh, so Jacob is going to, going to go to the same place to get a wife that his father Isaac went to get a wife. So think about God when you're choosing a spouse. Next, Think about God when you prepare for the future. In Genesis 28, 3 through 4, And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. So notice, the blessing is passed right on down to Jacob. It isn't just for Abraham, and it isn't just for Isaac. It goes right on to Jacob and his seed, which are the twelve tribes. And over and over again, you see this promise repeated. God loves to repeat the promises. You need to think about God when you prepare for the future. We already have our future laid out in the Bible. If you're saved, you know you're going to heaven. You know you're going to go out in the rapture. You know you're going to the judgment seat of Christ. You know you're going to miss the tribulation. You know you're going to reign in the millennium. If you got the works right, you're going to reign in the millennium. So as you prepare for the future, you need to have God on your mind. You know, is, are you setting your future up to where it's going to be easier to serve the Lord and do good at the judgment seat of Christ? That way you can rack up and get crowns and things like that and have some inheritance in the millennium. Are you setting your future up to where it's going to be hard to serve the Lord? Are you getting yourself so much in debt that you're going to have to spend all your time at work? You know, sometimes you have to do that and you can't help it, but you need to think about God as you prepare for the future. The next thing, think about God when you leave home. In Genesis 28, 5, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So Isaac sends away Jacob. Jacob is leaving home. He's going to be away from his mother. And we know for by the last chapter that Jacob is a mommy's boy. But he's leaving home. Maybe you are at that time in your life where you're about to leave home. Maybe you're just, you just graduated high school recently or something or college, whatever, and you're about to leave home. You need to think about God as you leave home. You know, sometimes people, when they leave home, they get in a bad way because they've been under their parents all this time, and their parents have kind of kept them in check. And then when they leave home, 
They forget about God. They forget about the Bible. They forget about meeting with other Christians. They just forget. You know, there's a lot of people who they went to church all their life and then they graduate high school and they just never come back. They never come back to church. They never read their Bible again. They just get so caught up in living their life and they, no, they don't just don't think about God anymore. And that's the problem with the age we're in is people don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. A lot of Christians will just go through life not even giving God a thought. Christians will do this. So you need to think about God when you leave home. Think about God when you get your mate, when you're choosing a mate. Think about God when you prepare for the future, when you leave home. And then next, think about God when you talk to your parents. In Genesis 28, 6 through 7, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to pay Dan Aram, to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to pay Dan Aram. So Jacob, when he's talking to his parents, you know, he obviously did something really stupid in the last chapter. He lied to his father, but he's showing to be uh, more respectful to his parents than Esau. I mean, he obeys his father and his mother. And he leaves, goes to pay dinner ram, just like he told him to do. And I mean, I guess you could say he's obedient to Rebecca because he did what she said in the last chapter, even though he shouldn't have. But the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Colossians 3, 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So, think about God when you talk to your parents. The way you talk to your parents is how you're going to end up talking to God. If you're talking hateful and mean to your parents... That's your going to be your attitude towards God eventually. And I understand some people have crummy parents, horrible parents, but still it gives you no right to just disobey them when they're telling you something that's good and right to do. Now, obviously, we're supposed to obey God rather than men, but when your parents are telling you to do something that's not wrong, you should do it. Jacob is simply obeying the instructions of his parents. And in Ephesians 6, 2 through 3, it says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Obeying your parents actually gives you more time on this earth. I mean, you're preparing for your future by talking good to your parents. You're making your future better and brighter by talking good to your parents. And uh, in Genesis 28, 8, it says, And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. Now remember that Isaac has already taken wicked wives. But he sees that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. Then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mah and took, up, and took unto the wives which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajeth to be his wife. So Esau must believe that since Ishmael is the son of Abraham, that it would be good to marry his daughters. He thinks that since Ishmael's the the son of Abraham, that that means he must be spiritual or something. But that's not so. All this pictures is a bad boy type guy getting with a religious girl thinking it's going to do him some good. I mean, imagine a bad boy type guy getting with some religious girl. I mean, that's not going to help him. The only thing that's going to help him is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, uh, getting with, you know, there's a lot of people that think if they if they start dating a, a, a good girl or a good religious girl or something, that that's going to make them seem right in the eyes of God or that's going to change them and help them change. You you need to change, you need to get saved and make sure you change first before you even seek 
someone to be with as a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife. But Esau must believe that since Ishmael is the son of Abraham, that it's good to marry his daughters. Uh, that's still not a good idea. That's not who he should have pursued. Now, the daughters of Ishmael may be better than the idol-worshipping daughters of Canaan, but it's still not good. When choosing a mate, as I said, you want to think about God when you choose a mate. Don't choose the lesser of two evils. You know, you got a girl over here that's okay. You got a girl over here that's really bad. Don't just choose the girl that's okay. You need to wait and choose one that wants to serve God that's a good Christian person. Not just religious. Not just someone who... Uh, well, for example, before I got married, there there was a girl that was... Uh, of she was she was a good person she was uh I, I think she was probably saved but she was caught up in the charismatic stuff and she wanted to go out with me but I, I i chose not to go out with her because i mean her her beliefs were just so off i mean she was trying to get me to believe that uh to be saved you had to be baptized in jesus name only and she was relying on water baptism to save her. Now, she could have possibly been saved before as a young child and got messed up in doctrine and things like that. But you just don't want to... If you're a Bible believer, you don't want to marry somebody that's so messed up in their doctrine. And the next thing is, I want to talk about is, be content with what you have. If you're thinking about God... And everything you do, you're going to be content with what you have. In Genesis 28, 10, and 11, it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So, Jacob didn't have nothing here. He was having to set up stones for pillows but still he had more than jesus jesus said he had, didn't have a place to lay his head and paul talks about being content with what you have paul talks about with food and raiment let us be there with content you know most people look around listen people are very uncontent very unthankful with what they have they always want more they think they deserve better no matter what you do for them, they're going to want more. It's just a plague of unthankfulness. One of the last day signs that Paul talks to Timothy about is being unthankful. People are so unthankful. But if you're thinking about God and everything that you're doing, you're content with what you have because if you're thinking about God, then you know that you don't deserve anything that He's given you. And you're just grateful that He's chose to give you anything that you have, whether it's a junky car, whether it's clothes that's got holes in them. I mean, at least you've got clothes. I mean, I think all my socks got holes in them. I don't care. Nobody sees my socks. I'm just happy I got socks. I work in a freezer, so I just put about three different socks on. That way, you know, the holes get covered up because all the holes are in different spots on the socks, so it all works out. Or just be, be content with what you have. I mean, you could always have it worse. I mean, if you've you got a spouse you hate, just be content with it. Try to love them anyway. You know, be content with what God's given you. But he puts these stones as his pillows. I mean, I would hate to get into a pillow fight with Jacob. I mean, you just get knocked out first thing. So he sets these stones for pillows. And verse 12 says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The ladder here is a picture of Jesus Christ himself. And this is confirmed by the Lord himself. In John 151, Jesus said himself, he says, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Since Jesus is the ladder, this shows that there is only one way 
from here to heaven. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, it says, And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the ladder and the door to get to eternal life. In John 10, 1 and 2, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So the latter reminds us that Jesus Christ is our go-between. He is our mediator. He's the only way between here and there. He's the only one that's, that makes it possible for salvation. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, it wouldn't be possible for you to be reconciled to God. It wouldn't be possible for you to have a prayer life. The next thing I want you to think about is that the Lord comes with clouds. In Genesis 28, 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So the Lord is up there above that ladder, next to them clouds up there. And see, uh, at the rapture, he's, you're going to meet the Lord in the air. You're going to meet him up in those clouds. At the second coming, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. The Bible talks about in, the, in Titus, the book of Titus. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, if you're thinking about the Lord, you're thinking about His coming. You're thinking about the Lord coming in the clouds to get you, and then later on coming back with you. And that's what Isaac was thinking about. He's seen the Lord up there, up standing above that ladder. And the, once again, the Lord gives him that promise again, tells him his seed's going to be as the dust of the earth. And, and spread abroad to the west and to the east and north and south, and that in him, that all the and, and in that and in his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So the, the physical seed, the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will inherit the land, and the millennium, and all families of the earth will be blessed through the physical nation of Israel, and we get in on the blessing spiritually. Today, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who came from that seed? And when you start talking like this, people start saying, well, you just believe all Jews are saved, even if they reject Jesus Christ. Absolutely not. Obviously, if a Jew rejects Jesus Christ, he's going to hell just like anybody else. But obviously, there's going to be a believing remnant that go into the millennium, a believing remnant of Israel that go into the millennium. Nobody's going in there just because of their race. And another thing you need to think about is the Lord is with you in the meantime. You see, uh, it may seem like things are afar off. It may seem like the raptures are afar off. It may seem like all these great promises are afar off. But remember that the Lord is with you in the meantime. In Genesis twenty eight fifteen, it says, And behold, I am with thee. God says to Jacob, Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So notice the promises are promised over and over again. The Lord is always giving them words of affirmation. Just like in the New Testament for you, when you read the Pauline epistles, He's continually giving you words of affirmation to confirm and keep it set in stone in your mind. You're eternally secure. You're getting out of here. He's not leaving you. He's not forsaking you. Then verse 16, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Just like today, 
many Christians don't know that their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. They don't know that the Lord is in them. You see, the Lord is in you, and you knew it not. Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Think about that for a minute. Your body is the temple. Know you not that Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, is in you? In 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. You know that Jesus Christ is in you. It's just sometimes you act like you don't know. But remember that your body is the temple. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, Paul says, What? Know ye not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It says in Genesis twenty-eight seventeen, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So, the gate of heaven. Jesus talks about the gates of hell in Matthew 16, 18. So heaven has gates. Hell has gates. Uh, he talks about the gate of heaven. Who's the gate of heaven? If anybody's the gate of heaven, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the door. Genesis 28, 18 and 19. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put up for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. So Bethel means house of God. And he later calls it El Bethel in Genesis 35, 7. And that means the God of the house of God. So the God of the house of God is even more important than the house. And Luz means light. Once again, everything in this story reminds you of the Lord Jesus, because Jesus Christ is light. In John eight twelve, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Genesis twenty eight twenty, and Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now, I'm not exactly sure how Jacob means this, but I just don't like how he says it personally. He says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. So he's got all these stipulations. If the Lord will do all this stuff, then he'll make the Lord his God. I mean, at least he's honest. God probably loves his honesty. But at the same time, he's got all this, if you'll do this for me, then I'll do this for you type of thing going on. I, I much prefer the three Hebrew boys' attitudes in uh, the the book of Daniel. That you know, even even if God didn't deliver them, they're going to serve God and choose God anyway. They're still not going to worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, no matter what God does, whether God helps them or or kills them or allows them to be killed. You know, they they were going to serve God. And I, I just like that attitude a lot better. Jacob, as I said, he's not one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Obviously, he's a great man in the Bible. But still, I mean, if you ask me who my favorite character is, it's probably not going to be Jacob. And I, I just want to read you that in Daniel real quick. In Daniel 3, uh, 15, 
It says, Now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So God didn't have to do anything for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to choose God over those false gods that Nebuchadnezzar has. And that's the best way to put it. That's the best attitude to have. And that's why I like those three Hebrew boys more than I like to read about Jacob. So, Genesis 28, keep your mind on things above, keep your mind on the Lord, you'll be, out, you'll be so much better off. Know ye not that the Lord is in you. Don't forget that the Lord dwells in you. 